we just said amen. We're going to start our teaching right now. All right, so we find ourselves in the book of Esther, which is a really cool book because not only is it a story that we get to read about in the Bible, but it's history. It's real. The stuff that we're going to read in this book, much like the rest of the Bible, has really taken place. But there is so much historical t context around this book. So to fully understand it, before we even start reading, I want to bring you guys back to the beginning. Like literally the beginning of the Bible. Like Genesis 1-1 where it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Not that far at the beginning, but just a couple more chapters. There's a story of these people named Adam and Eve. Who's heard this story before? Adam and Eve. I'm going to take this mic off because I'm going to end up breaking it on accident. Adam and Eve, the first man and woman on earth, right? The first humans on earth. And what happens? God gives them a command. They can eat whatever they want except the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So what happens? They ate it. They ate. I tried to say ate and eat at the same time, right? Satan tempts them tells them it's not going to be all that bad, and they eat it. And sin enters the world. The world was perfect at that time. And, and sin enters the world, and Adam and Eve are ashamed of what they did, so much so that they actually cover themselves. They try to hide from God, who's literally walking through the garden. They actually used to literally, like, God used to walk with them. But then what happens? He actually speaks to Adam and Eve, he tells them what's going to happen now, and then he says something to the serpent. He says something to Satan. It's Genesis 3.15. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. You guys are like, Sean, where are you going with this? Guys, ever since the beginning, what is God telling Satan? Put that verse back up. Ever since the beginning. The gospel has been present. The gospel has been the plan that God would send his Jesus to die on the cross for our sins and he would rise again from the dead. It's been the plan since the beginning. So much so that in the third chapter of the Bible, God is saying, you're going you're gonna to strike his heel. Some other translations say, you're going to bruise his heel. Satan, you're going to bruise Jesus' heel. He's going to die on the cross. But he's going to crush your head. He's going to rise again from the dead. He's going to conquer death. He's going to conquer hell. He's literally going to crush your head. And in the very end, he's going to throw you in the fiery pit. Jesus wins. So ever since this was said, ever since this was said between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers, Satan has been scared of this offspring coming has been scared of the fact that Jesus would come on earth. So his goal since the beginning was to literally get rid of the Jewish people. You see it throughout the Old Testament and even into the New Testament. Satan wants to destroy them because he doesn't want this offspring, Jesus, to come. So in the book of Exodus, where do you find all the Jewish people, the nation of Israel? Where do you find them? In Egypt, in slavery, getting just completely taken advantage of, getting beaten up, to the point where eventually the newborn males are all going to be tossed into the Nile River, are going to be killed, except for Moses. He's going to be saved. And he's going to lead the Jewish people out of Egypt to the Red Sea, to where Pharaoh's great plan now is to kill them at the Red Sea, destroy all the Jewish people. Why? Because Satan doesn't want Jesus to come. But God splits the sea. They walk through it. They make it to the promised land. Pharaoh's army is defeated. You actually see it again in the New Testament when Herod finds out about the birth of Jesus. What does he say? All the males two and younger in Bethlehem should be killed. All the males two and younger should be killed. Why? Because he hears about this Jesus who was born and Satan doesn't want this to happen. You see this theme throughout scripture where Satan is trying to destroy God's people because he doesn't want God's plan to come to fruition, but God is God, so God's plan is going to happen. And Esther, this story is just another example. There's this guy, Haman, who's going to want to kill all the Jewish people. He's going to want to try to stop God's plan. He doesn't want this to take place. This is what Satan's trying to do. So we see Israel in this story. We see the Jewish people. They've been removed from the promised land because they didn't submit to God's rule. But God is faithful, so he disciplines them instead of destroying them. 
God made promises to Abraham that he would have many offspring, that he would, many nations would come from him, and he's going to keep these promises. So before we jump into Esther, what you'll see in this book, which is so interesting, is you actually won't ever see God mentioned. But you can't help but see God throughout this whole book. And the overarching theme, I believe, is what Romans 8.28 says. It's a verse you guys are probably very familiar with. It says, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. What you're going to see is God's plan is sovereign. God's plan for us, God's plan for the world, it's going to take place. So you're going to see so many crazy things throughout this book. Where if you're not a believer, if you're not a Christian, you're going to go, oh, that's a crazy coincidence. That's just a coincidence. That's just a coincidence. But you go on and on throughout this book, you go, there's no way every single small detail like that is a coincidence. Mordecai, Esther's cousin, just happens to adopt her just happens to stay in this nation when he doesn't have to, just happens to overhear these guys' plans to kill the king. The king just happens at some point to be reading the story of how Mordecai actually stepped in and saved his life, and this just happened, and that just happened, just happened. God makes all things work together. I love what Genesis 50, 20 says. It says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Another translation says, what you intended for evil, God meant for good. Guys, God's in control. And if you don't see that by the end of this study, like, I don't know what you're listening to, what you're reading, because that's what we're going to see. God is in control, and he makes things work together for good. But what I love about this story, too, because we read about stories like God's, you know, parting the sea, Jesus stops the storm. But we're going to say that God works in ordinary ways, too. He's going to use a young Jewish girl to save a nation, to save a people through just ordinary, simple ways. So we find ourselves, it's Esther chapter 1, verse 1. It says, this is what happened during the time of Xerxes. You guys ever hear the name Xerxes? It's the king in history. The Xerxes who ruled over 127 provinces stretching from India to Kush. At that time, King Xerxes reigned from his royal throne in the citadel of Susa. So what happens? This guy, Xerxes, very powerful king. He rules over 127 provinces. This is a large portion of the world. I actually had a map. I forgot to put it in my notes, I just realized. But I had a map for you guys. Where Persia is modern-day Iran. It's a country that exists today. But he ruled over 127 provinces. It's the largest empire ever up to that point. Turkey, Iraq, Iran, Pakistan, Jordan, parts of Egypt, Sudan, Libya, Arabia, uh, Lebanon, Israel. Xerxes is a well-documented king. He reigned from 486 to 465 BC. And he actually, the ruins of his palace, the story that we're reading Where most of this takes place, the ruins, Persepolis, still exists today. I have a picture of it. This is where this story takes place. Like, this is real stuff. This stuff really happened. You can go visit these ruins. This is Xerxes' palace. This is mind-blowing to me. This is crazy. So you've got this all-powerful king, the greatest king the world has ever known, the most powerful empire, the biggest empire that the world has ever known, verse Three. And in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his nobles and officials, the military leaders of Persia and Media, the princes and the nobles of the provinces were present. Listen to this: for a full hundred and eighty days, this is a hundred and eighty day party. He displayed the vast wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and glory of his majesty. When these days were over, the king gave a banquet lasting seven days. So if 180 days wasn't enough, now he has another seven-day party. In the enclosed garden of the king's palace, for all the people from the least to the greatest who were in the citadel of Susa. The garden had hangings of white and blue linen fastened with cords of white linen and purple material to silver rings on marble pillars. There were couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of Porf, I can't say that. Porphyry, marble, mother of pearl, and other costly stones. Wine was served in goblets of gold, each one different from the other. 
The royal wine was abundant in keeping with the king's liberality. By the king's command, each guest was allowed to drink with no restrictions. For the king instructed all the wine stewards to serve each man what he wished. Queen Vashti also gave a banquet for the women in the royal palace of King Xerxes. Wow, there's a lot happening. We see three different parties in these few verses. We see one for 180 days. And this first party, very simply, is for all the political and military leaders. And Xerxes just wants to show how amazing he is. There's elaborate details of how great this party is. Everyone that came to the second party says the one that lasted seven days, that was for the rest of the people. Each had their own golden goblet to drink wine from, to get drunk from. They all had their own individual special cup. I don't know if they wrote their initials on it. I don't know how it worked. But he just wanted to show off. Number one, if you're taking notes, first of four, pride has to prove itself. Pride has to prove itself. He throws these two parties, and then his wife throws another party for all the ladies. And it's described as the splendor and glory of his majesty. Those words that we read there, splendor and glory of his majesty, those are words we typically associate with God. Not with people. Not with humans. God's the one who has majesty. God's the one who has glory, not us. God's the one who has splendor, not us. But there's something in this guy, Xerxes. He's a prideful, arrogant leader. He thinks he's so amazing. He's all powerful. He's literally, he's got the largest empire in the world. Why does he feel like he has to throw these parties to show off? Because he feels like he has to prove himself. In reality, he's this super insecure dude, but because he's this powerful king, i got to prove myself. I don't know if you guys have ever felt like this. But as humans, as God's children, we have nothing to prove. There's nothing we have to do to prove ourselves, to prove. Listen, if all you do is talk about how amazing you are, you kind of miss the point. (laughs) If you have to prove yourself, you're not what you say you are because people will see who you are. You have nothing to prove. This guy's a prideful, arrogant leader, and he throws these parties very simply to say, see how awesome I am? Do you guys know anyone like this? Do you have that, like, person, classmate, friend, who it's just like all they do is show off? Look at me. I'm amazing. I'm awesome. Anyone that person? (laughs) You're that guy. I know. You lost your Bible. (laughs) Start reading it. You won't be that guy anymore. (laughs) I knew a guy, and it's sad to say, but it was a guy who worked here years ago. And I had an opportunity to talk to him one time. He was like, hey, you're you're Sean, right? I was like, you know it. Yeah, you've heard of me, haven't you? Probably from my battles in Egypt. No, I don't know. I don't know. But he's like, hey, you're Sean, right? I'm like, yeah. He's like, hey, it's really nice to meet you. I'm like, nice to meet you, too. He's like, you know what? We should hang out. Like, yeah, that'd be cool. He's like, I've really been wanting for you to get to know me. You've been wanting to get to know me. (laughs) Like, that's my thought. Like, no, but his words were, I've been wanting for you to get to know me. See how awesome I am? Now, he didn't say that last part. But people like that. Listen, pride is dangerous. Pride is the root of all sin, legitimately. Pride is when Satan says, I want to be like God. Pride is when Adam and Eve say, I want to be like God, knowing good and evil. That's why they ate the fruit, because of pride. Pride is literally the root of all sin. Pride is putting yourself first, putting you above God, putting yourself above everything. And what we see in this guy, Xerxes, pride is so dangerous. We all struggle with it. As he starts off with this giant party because he wants to prove himself. Look how awesome I am. Look how amazing I am. I'm the greatest king there's ever been. But look what happens with pride. Verse 10. On the seventh day, when King Xerxes was in high spirits from wine, another translation would say <laughs> he's drunk. He commanded the seven eunuchs who served him, Mehuman, Bista, Harbona, Bigtha, Bakhtha, 
Zethar and Cargus. There's a big thaw. I wonder if there's a skinny thaw somewhere. <laughs> Verse 11. To bring him before Queen Vashti, wearing her royal crown, in order to display her beauty to the people and nobles, for she was lovely to look at. But when the attendants delivered the king's command, Vashti refused to come, and the king became furious and burned with anger. Now, I'm going to try to put this into, like, modern-day translation, so please excuse how I say this. This is not, like, how I view women, but here's what happened. And what he did was very wrong, I'm just going to say. But King Xerxes got drunk on wine. I'm sure the guys are just being guys. Guys are stupid. I'm just going to, I'm a guy. I can say it. Yeah. Listen. Guys, guys are so stupid, there's guys clapping right now when I said it. <laughs> like, but listen, so Xerxes, prideful, who wants to show himself off, number two, number two, pride leads to other sins. Pride leads to other sins. Now listen, shh. Xerxes gets drunk. I'm sure he's just thinking, what else can I prove? How else can I show them how awesome I am? How else can I show them how amazing I am? He's drunk. He's out of his mind. He doesn't even know what's going on. And he goes, you know what? Like, this is like the modern-day translation of this. I want everyone to see how hot my wife is. Like, that's literally what happens here. I'm not trying to be funny when I say that. I'm not trying to, but, like, what we would say today is, like, that's what he's doing right here. So he's like, I want to show her off. Now, this is weird. Like, guys, can you imagine if I ever were like, oh, you know what? Guys, watch, look how hot my wife is. Babe, come up here and show them how hot. Like, that would be weird. That's wrong. That's disrespectful. That's disrespecting women. You don't do that. So he gets drunk, and then he disrespects his wife, treats her like material, treats her like dirt, you know, the Bible is clear. Husbands are to love their wives like Christ loved the church. This guy is drunk and treating his wife like a piece of meat. Like, literally, this guy is, like, there's no nice way to, this is the most powerful king in the world, but he's a loser who doesn't know how to treat women. Pride leads to other sins. If you don't catch your pride in time, and here's, here's what I mean. King David, you guys all know David, right? Really quick, super fast, he sees a woman bathing on the roof. It's not his wife. She's married to someone else. They end up, he ends up getting her pregnant. Then he sends, listen, then he sends her husband to the front lines of war so that he'll die. So pride, he notices something that he wants. Leads to a sin, leads to a sin. It goes from noticing something to being a murderer. Pride leads to other sins. It's the snowball effect. You guys ever see that like in a cartoon back in the day where like they'd be on a mountain, a snowy mountain, and they'd fall into a snowball, and they would get bigger and bigger as it rolls downhill? This is what pride is. It starts small. Then one thing. Then another thing. Then another Suddenly you're like, how did I get here? This church should be familiar with it. The founding pastor of this church fell. He, he, he had sin in his life, and I don't know when it started. I don't know how it started. I don't know the whole story, but I know it, it started with one little thing. And it got to the point where he couldn't serve anymore when his sin found him out. Because it got bigger and bigger, and bigger. But she refused. He makes this terrible request. He gets angry. She says no. And he's all mad at her. He ruled 127 provinces, but he couldn't control himself. Shh. Think about that. He came over 127 provinces, but he couldn't control himself. Like he was just sitting in service talking as the guy with the microphone was staring at him. Just couldn't control himself. He's reaching into his pocket. Couldn't control himself. On her phone. Couldn't control herself. (laughs) 
which leads me to our third point, verse 13. Pride makes bad decisions. Since it was customary for the king, verse 13, to consult experts in matters of law and justice, he spoke with wise men who understood the times and were closest to the king. Karshana, Shethar, Edmatha, Tarshish, Meres, Marsena, and Memucan, the seven nobles of Persia and Media, who had special access to the king and were highest in the kingdom. According to law, what must be done to Queen Vashti, he asked. She's not obeyed the command of King Xerxes that the eunuchs have taken to her. Then Mebuchan replied in the presence of the king and the nobles, Queen Vashti has done wrong not only against the king, but also against all the nobles and the peoples of all the provinces of King Xerxes. For the queen's conduct will become known to all the women, so they will despise their husbands and say, King Xerxes commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, but she would not come. This very day the Persian and Median women of the nobility who have heard about the queen's conduct, will respond to all the king's nobles in the same way. There will be no end of disrespect and discord. Therefore, if it pleases the king, let him issue a royal decree, and let it be written in the laws of Persia and Media, which cannot be re repealed, that Vashti is never again to enter the presence of King Xerxes. Also let the king give her royal position to someone else who's better than she. That when the king's edict is proclaimed throughout all his vast realm, all the women will respect their husbands from the least to the greatest. Pride makes bad decisions. Guys, we're all sinners. We just are. That's why we need to surround ourselves with good people. People who will point us to Jesus. People who help us make decisions. People who won't distract us during service. People who won't talk to us. People who won't try to show us stuff on the... Like, we've got to separate ourselves from people who bring us down and surround ourselves with good people. I'm not talking internet personalities. I'm not, like, I'm not talking that. But good people who will pour into you, who will help you make good decisions. Because here's who Xerxes surrounds himself with. People who are experts in matters of law and justice. He spoke with the wise men who, what, understood the times. These dudes got culture. These dudes understand what was going on in the world at those times. Well, guys, the Bible is not about culture today. The Bible is about what God wants and what he has for us. I don't care what the culture is. If I hear another person say, well, you know, the Bible was written back then. It's just referring to, like, the culture of those times. No, it's not. The Bible's living and active. Don't tell me it doesn't say what it says, because it says what it says, and it's God's word. God's word says what it says. It's not a cultural book. It's his words. It's his laws. It's what he wants for us. I want to surround myself with people who are going to point me to God's word. Not people who are going to say, well, it's 2023, so, you know, when, when men want to be women and women want to be men, it's okay. And, like, that's, that's just how God, because God wrote the Bible when, it was, when the world wasn't like this. That's, that, that's not what it means today. If people want to do this, if people want to do that, that's okay because that's how it is. That's the culture in the world today. I don't care. Like, I'm not trying to be mean. Like, you can clearly tell I'm passionate about this. But I don't care about the culture. One of the worst things that has happened to the church is it tries to keep up with the culture of today. That's not our role. Our role is to point people to Jesus. And I'm not saying Calvary Chapel. I'm saying the church in America, for some reason, Feel like we be, we've got to surround ourselves not with experts in the culture, people who understood the times. We've got to surround ourselves with people who know Jesus and who will point us to him so that we won't make bad decisions. We need people who encourage us to obedience, not disobedience. Who are your friends, your mentors, your counselors? Xerxes is drunk and angry. So his counselors tell him, make a rule. Banish your wife. It's funny. It starts off where he's like, hey, I want to show her off. She's hot and I want everyone to see her. So now I don't ever want to see her again. See how stupid pride is? I want everyone to see her. Oh, get her away from me. I'm mad at her. Eh. It's stupid. I, didn't, I took this point out of it because I felt like it was the same point. But I actually had also written pride is stupid because it just is. Pride is stupid. He's drunk and angry. You know what good friends would have done? Hey, bro, don't make a decision right now. You are not in the right state. Sleep on it. Take a nap. We'll talk in the morning. But they're like, ooh, make a rule. 
Make it where all wives have to listen to their husbands and have to do with their husbands. Because what's going to happen is the world's going to find out that she didn't listen to you. And then all the wives aren't going to listen to their husbands. You don't want this to happen. So banish your wife and make a rule where wives have to listen to their husbands all the time and do whatever their husbands say. He surrounded himself with terrible people, so they give him terrible advice, and they encourage him to disobedience instead of obedience. We need people who point us to Jesus, who will help us make good decisions. And look how bad his decision is. Verse 21, the king and his nobles were pleased with this advice, so the king did, as Memucan proposed. He sent dispatches to all parts of the kingdom, to each province in its own script, and to each people in their own language, proclaiming that every man should be ruler over his own household using his native tongue. He goes along with it. He listens to their advice. That's a great idea. If you ever have a friend who, like, tells you to do something, you're like, no, you do it. And they're like, there's no way I'm doing it. Don't do it. <laughs> right? Like, stop listening to people. That's like when people are like, if, if they jumped off a bridge, would you jump off too? Like... I, I would if they did it first, <laughs> right? But this is a terrible decision, but he does it. So you guys are probably, like, I talked about pride a lot. He makes this edict. He makes this plan. He sends his wife away. He sends her into exile. So what, what can we learn from this? Listen, pride goes before destruction. Last and finally, pride goes before destruction. What do I mean? Proverbs sixteen eighteen says this, pride goes before destruction. A haughty spirit before a fall. I told you guys, this was the most powerful king of the time of the largest empire ever. And what's interesting, and I'll say this again next week, but we've got Esther chapter 1, and then Esther chapter 2 starts with later, when King Xerxes' fury had subsided. He remembered Vashti and what she'd done, what he had decreed about her. Now, this looks like it's just a continuation of the story, but this is four years later, between chapter one and chapter two. Four years goes by. So what am I, where am I going with this? Right after this takes place, in these four years, the Persian Navy, his Navy, loses this big battle. They literally lose the most powerful empire in the world. In the year 480. Then in the year 479, a year later, this is B.C., so the years go in reverse, his Persian army is defeated. He won't have this world empire that he so greatly desires. He throws this, this party to show how amazing he is, how powerful he is, how incredible he is, and then he loses two wars in a row. Destruction comes. Pride, you guys have heard it. Pride comes before the fall. So, what can we learn? Guys, God is the ultimate authority. I don't care how powerful Xerxes is. Scripture tells us straight up, Romans 13, 1, there's no authority except that which God has established. <clears throat> the authorities that exist have been established by God. Any authority anyone has, God has given them. Xerxes might sit there and be so prideful and arrogant, but the reality is he wouldn't be in that seat if God didn't allow him in that seat, if God didn't give him that throne. None of his wealth or power could save him. Matthew 6.33 says, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Not ask well. I had a typo there. My bad. But we seek, it doesn't, like, it doesn't matter how rich you are. It doesn't matter how many days of parties you throw. It doesn't matter that everyone gets a golden goblet. We seek first his kingdom. We seek first his righteousness. And here's the thought I want to close with. We need to regularly remember God's greatness. It keeps things in perspective. When Xerxes is described as the splendor and majesty of his glory, those are words I said earlier, sorry, the splendor and glory of his majesty, those are words used to describe God. Our life is kept in perspective when we remember how great God is. And I read this amazing quote. The author said, The greatest king in the world, or the most powerful king in the world, Xerxes, is simply a pawn in God's plan. 
God's going to use this story. He's going to use this king. He's going to use his stupidity to banish his wife to do an amazing thing for his people through Esther. (laughs) He's going to use all this guy's pride, all this guy's arrogance to do what God does so his plan will come place. Because the most powerful king in the world is a pawn. Pawn's the weakest piece on the chessboard. You send out your pawns. You sacrifice your pawns. There's nothing special about the pawns. Xerxes is a pawn. All his wealth, all his extravagance, all his power is nothing compared to God. And the story closes where this Vashti, she rejects Xerxes once. And she's forever banished from his presence. Can you guys imagine if the first time you ever disobeyed God, you were just banished from his presence forever? But God's not Xerxes. See, we reject God all the time. But he sent his son Jesus to bring us into his presence. God overcame all our rebellion to bring us to a right relationship with him. We don't just get heaven as Christians when we die because he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for us, but we get him. We get to be with him. We get eternity with him, not because of how good we are, but because of his greatness. So we're going to close in communion. Worship team, you guys can come up and get ready. We're going to have our volunteers pass this out. Hopefully it goes pretty quick. I'm going to ask that you guys grab your elements. Grab the cup. It's all those, it's those like two-in-ones. It's got the cup and the cracker in it. Shh, don't talk during this time, though. Listen, we're going to take communion. Why? Because we talked about pride tonight. And I think it's very, very hard to be prideful when you remember what Jesus did for us. It's really, really hard to be prideful when you remember what Jesus did for us. You guys can pass those down the aisle. Let it it kind of scoot down if that works. Shh. Guys, your attention up here, your attention on me. We can pass these out and still pay attention. I'm just going to wait till everyone gets it because this seems to be too much for you guys. There should be no talking. Shh. I don't know why I'm still hearing stuff. Shh. How's it going, guys? You guys are really talkative. Everything good? All right, cool. Who do we get to walk you to after service tonight? Who brought you? Your grandpa. It's going to be cool meeting him. That will be really nice. I'm sure he's a swell guy. This is like the most humbling thing we as Christians can do. And it's hard to be prideful. It's hard to be arrogant. It's hard to feel good about yourself when you look at this. Because the night before Jesus died, he instituted this for us with his disciples. He took some bread. He broke it. He said, this is my body broken for you, knowing he's about to go on the cross to suffer, to die, to be beaten. And he takes wine and he passes it around. He says, drink this. This is my blood. He knows his blood's going to be shed. This is going to be shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink it in remembrance of me. So I just want to take like 30 seconds. If you're in this room and you're not a Christian, please don't take this. It's not for you. But I said, it's hard to be prideful when you remember what he did for us. So I just want to take 30 seconds for you just to sit with God for a second and say, God, search me. Search me. See if there's any pride in me. See if there's any arrogance. See if there's anything that you need to get rid of. And just turn it over to him. And then we'll take and we'll eat and we'll drink together. Just take 30 seconds with him.
And so he broke the bread, passed around, and he said, eat this in remembrance of me. This is my body broken for you. Let's eat. And he said, this is my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink this in remembrance of me. Before we pray, I'm just going to ask that you guys hold on to that for a second. You can kind of set it in your seat, set it upright. We're going to close in worship. When we're done and we dismiss the small groups, we'll have trash cans in the back. If you guys can throw out your communion cups. But just set them gently kind of in that crack of your seat so they don't tip over, so they don't fall, so we don't crush them. And then we'll throw them away afterwards. But let me pray for you guys. Jesus, thank you for tonight. Thank you for what you did on the cross for us. And we just pray that you would help us to be humble, that you would help us to follow you, that you would help us to get pride out of the way and just remember how great you are. Even as we worship right now, we remember how great you are. We love you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you guys stand with me?